All right, let me get started. So, hey everyone, thank you for coming along today. So my name is Jess, and today I'm gonna to be talking to you about what life is like as a technical designer. So I'm a technical designer across at Rare. So we're set in the picturesque countryside in the Midlands near Twycross. And as you can see by this gorgeous photo taken by one of my colleagues, Paul Makacek, we are surrounded by a whole lot of nature. Here, so you can see what our entire kind of campus looks like. We have the four barns, as they're affection affectionately known, and our kind of pond and campus in the centre. And then you can see some of the grounds that we're often out and exploring around. So I'm not going to lie, if you're a bit of a country lad or lass like me, then Rare's campus is a bit of a dream come true. And you can kind of see how our location as a studio has had a bit of, of an influence on some of the games we've made before. So Rare is a long established studio. I think we're actually celebrating our 34th birthday this year, which is pretty good going for a game studio. For me, it's kind of insane that there are people who are at Rare who have been making games since before I was born. And there's something pretty magical about being able to work and learn from the developers that helped make some of my childhood favorites. And I think that kind of heritage and talent continues to shine through in our latest title, Sea of Thieves where you can discover your inner pirate and set sails out onto the high seas. So that gives you a bit of context as to what we do as a studio and the kind of games we've made in the past. So my plan for today is I want to take you through a brief overview of the process of making games, an in-depth look into what, te what technical design is like, and finally, take a look into some of the programs you can get involved in now if you want to start making games. So. Let's start with an, just a brief overview of the development pipeline, just if you, so understand how games are made so I can kind of show you where technical designers slot into this process. So a game normally starts in pre-production. So here we're concepting out the feel of the game, whether that's through pieces of concept art like this, or even making or building out little prototype levels. Now these often take two routes to begin with. One is the pretty version, where we test out our lighting, our materials, our art style, we're checking out all sorts of different things, and we're basically starting to turn our concept art into reality. And the second type of prototype, well, it tends to look a little bit more like this. So this was a very, very, very early stage prototype for Sea of Thieves to just try out different ideas for the mechanics that would eventually form out the base experience. Everything is incredibly janky looking. I mean, I can't tell if I'm looking at the shark or if the shark is looking at me, but that's deliberate because these prototypes, they're all about speed. They're about failing fast, finding out what design works and feels good and what doesn't and constantly trying new things. And everything's going to be binned when we move into production anyway. So kind of doesn't really matter what it looks like. And as we head into production, these two branches converge. So things start off very basic, very blocky and are iterated on over time to bring up the quality levels and eventually potentially several years later, we end up with something like this. We have our kind of finished experience. And then we move into the launch phase. Now, normally, this is when you get your, like, your swanky looking trailers, you start building up the hype for the game, you get your reviewers and press in. Um, so I'm going to show you the trailer for Sea of Thieves in case you haven't seen it. Um, I apologize, the audio is going to come out of my laptop rather than out the speakers, but you'll get the drift. all the hype is built, everyone's loving the trailers and stuff, you hit that big launch button and then you're done. Well, that's what happened traditionally, but games are changing. So Sea of Thieves is a game as a service. It's always adding in new content and so development never really finishes. 
So for Sea of Thieves, all the stages that I've just mentioned, pre-production, production, and kind of launch, were constantly being put into motion. So one team is testing out new ideas and features for future releases. Another team is going to be taking those approved concepted ideas and integrating them into the already game that's there. Another team is going to be sorting your running tests, sorting release candidates, pulling together a marketing strategy, informing the community and more. So we're always in this perpetual making. And even just a couple of weeks ago, we launched our anniversary update, which included big new features like the arena, tall tales, and then things like fishing as well. So in this really long and pretty vast pipeline that encompasses hundreds of different roles, where do technical designers fit into all of this? And even more so, what is a technical designer? So technical design is a relatively new role in the games industry. I think most people now are aware of technical artists, so those who span the technical and art disciplines, who in many ways just use art and math to make just beautiful things like winds and waves and all your clouds and oh, I love the work that they get to do because it's so pretty. And technical designers, well, we're kind of similar, except we span the programming and design disciplines. I mean, Arc is nowhere near as pretty, but it is just as important. So working with designers, we come up with new ideas and features for the game. But instead of just working things out on paper or potentially in spreadsheets, we actually start building out prototypes in the engine themselves. So this screenshot was taken from when I was building, I think, my honors project at university, so a few years back. But these kind of grayscale environments, or if we're really lucky, kind of these super rough early asset playgrounds, they're where we spend a lot of our time. We aren't focused on visual appeal unless we need it for a specific gameplay reason. Instead, we're focused on things around game feel, like fluid controls, readability of actions, how our player should be feeling in that moment, and more. So I don't know, I didn't know how um, involved in games design you guys would be, so I just wanted to explain a little, quick little bit about game engines in case you hadn't seen them before. So games are built inside these pieces of software we call game engines, or just engines for short. And this screenshot is from Unreal Engine, and this is the editor of it. So a lot of the models and assets, so things here like the tables and chairs, they get built out in separate um, pieces of software that also include things like your animations, some of your um, sound and music effects, things like that. They all get built separately and then all imported into the editor. And kind of the gist of a game engine is it's like a framework of a house. It's this shell that allows developers to go in and place things where they want to and decide how other players will live in that space. So at a really high level, the game engine just handles the logic for what the players can see and hear around them and how players can move and interact with that world. So we use Unreal Engine at Rare. Um, and it's the same engine, obviously, that's used to make Fortnite, but they also license it out to hundreds of other developers across the world. So a few examples, things like PUBG, Tetra, Dragon Ball Fighter Z, Ark, Rocket League, and of course our very own Sea of Thieves are all made inside Unreal, as well as what my honors project was. So as technical designers, we can go into an engine and we can build what we see in our heads. And having that ability is so useful. Sometimes you can't articulate exactly what you are looking for, or your paper prototypes can't get across that feeling that you're wanting, especially if you're doing something completely new and there aren't really any reference points for it. It's so powerful, and it can avoid a lot of back and forth and potential frustration if you're able to make what you're thinking of, put that in somebody else's hands and go, here, this is what I mean. And it may be janky, it may be super unoptimal, doesn't have to be pretty, but if it takes that vision out of your head so others can share it, so others can buy into it, that's what can lead to a successful project. So at a high level, technical designers concept out and build new ideas and features. But how do we go about doing that? So what does my kind of day-to-day -day life look like as a technical designer? Well, other disciplines may have the view that I'm constantly changing my mind or writing a ton of documentation, getting distracted by new ideas, or actually having a solid plan of what I'm doing. Well, often I have no idea what I'm doing because I'm experimenting. This is the really cool part. Technical designers are a lot like pioneers. We're kind of forging the way ahead. We're going to unknown places with sometimes barely more than like a gut feeling that there's going to be something cool in that direction. We're constantly trying out new things. We're coming up with new ideas and testing it out to see what it's like. So we fail a lot, but in many ways, that's a totally good thing. So Thomas Edison famously said, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work for that specific scenario. 
So the interesting thing about games design is it's very rarely a one solution fits all. So even if what I'm trying to do, yay. OK, maybe not. <laughs> so even if what I'm trying to do fails in the current context, it doesn't actually mean I've wasted my time. Because although what I've done may not be useful now, it's very possible that thinking may have a use on another point, on another feature, potentially even on another project. But hey, at least nothing's ever thrown away. And because everything we don't put, because everything we do doesn't always get put into our project, we can put it into our meta metaphorical tool belt instead. So this was a concept my lead introduced me to. It's like this bank of skills or processes that we can pull on at any point to kind of solve a problem or potentially even devise a new challenge for a player. It's something that we develop over time through experience and making, but there are a few things we can do to kind of help build up that wee bit quicker. So let's look at some of the tools we can actually add to our belt. So one of the things I see a lot of kind of younger or more inexperienced designers do is to only be inspired by other games. Now, there is nothing wrong with admiring other games, but if all you do is play games and they're the only things that inform your work, you're never going to come up with something new and something different because you're already just recycling content that exists. And because of that, it's never necessarily going to be unique. Hobbies and life experiences are the most important things for a games designer because it means we can pull on first-hand experiences not regurgitate somebody else's. We probably don't understand the themes or ideas as well secondhand, and then we just may end up with a poor representation of what the initial idea was. So I grew up in the Highlands of Scotland, as I kind of mentioned in the warm up, um, and I did a lot of adventuring out there, which is something I pull on pretty often when I'm doing design work. But I don't solely rely on that to get me through. I keep trying new things. I keep opening myself up to new experiences. So since starting at Rare, I've picked up ice skating, bouldering, and I've even taken an alpaca for a walk because you can totally do that and it's amazing and they're really fluffy. And going out and experiencing all these new things will often inspire your work in ways that you can't imagine. So for that, I will try anything once, including a couple of weeks weekends ago, completing a 10K rough runner alongside all my th this lovely bunch from Rare. Now, caveat, I hate mud, I hate water, and I hate running. So you're probably asking me, why on earth did you do this? Well, mainly for charity, which is what I was reminding myself of when I was wading waist deep through a muddy puddle. But I also wanted to try it. It's the first time in my life that I've probably even been in remotely good enough shape to be able to try and attempt finishing this kind of thing. So I channeled my inner Shia LaBeouf and lo and behold, actually made it to the end. And you know what? I weirdly, I hated every minute of it and I loved every moment of it. And when I look back on that experience now, it was the people that I was with that made such a difference. And it would not have been the same experience if I'd been alone. And what about those people made it so special? That made a difference. Well, we were all in it together. We're all experiencing kind of the same trials for similar causes. We all had different skills so we could kind of support each other and encourage each other in turn. And it's that analysis of your events in your life. It's that pattern finding that brings me to my next point. So whilst you're out experiencing everything, look at all the interactions that you could systemize. Because once you start looking, you kind of find them everywhere. So this example is from a mobile game called Florence, which tells the story about first love. And here, as the conversation flows more easily between the two of you as you're on your first date, it's represented by you needing less and less pieces to make up the speech bubbles, till finally you get that last point where you just pop one in and you just click. It takes everything, something that we do every day, talking to each other, and it represents it in not only an interesting, interactable manner, but one that clearly conveys the emotional feeling as well. And whilst you're looking at your systems and how to apply them to your project, always keep your aims in mind. What's the goal of the mechanic that you're implementing? What are you trying to ev evoke in a, a, like a specific feeler in a playing? Are you trying to change the pace of play somehow? Like, what are you trying to accomplish? And by having a goal, it means you can evaluate your current mechanic against where you're trying to go. It provides a platform where you can kind of iterate consciously in kind of a bit more of a directional way, rather than just throwing everything at a wall and seeing what sticks. And it also makes it easier to kind of simplify, strip down, or even completely remove complex or even potentially loved systems. So you may have heard the phrase, kill your darlings, and it's easy to say, but can be really, really hard to do. So the end goal that you want for your mechanics most of the time is for them to be useful and intuitive to the player. 
And it helps if you really understand what the goal or intent behind a mechanic is, because then you have a set of criteria that you can constantly be evaluating against. It kind of gives you this almost unbiased space where you have to judge that mechanic about what you're putting into the game. And if you have something that you love but isn't helping you achieve your player goals, it also helps justify what to leave out. So the best mechanics or verbs are often those which are the most versatile. So these take many, many iterations and all sorts of different forms before they can be made right. But once you get them there, they can be pretty magical. So Mario and his jump is a great example of this. It can be used to gain height or extra distance, defeat or distract an enemy, remove obstacles, activate switches, collect pickups and more. And even though it has this huge scope of all these different things that it can do, it never feels overwhelming. And Alto's Adventure also uses jumps in a similar way. You can use your jump to make it over chasms, bounce on top of obstacles, collect pickups. Or by holding jump, you can do backflips, which if landed successfully, can give you a speed boost to make larger jumps or crash through those other obstacles. So if you want more information on kind of versatile verbs, because this could be a whole talk in itself, there is a fantastic YouTube video by a guy called Mark Brown, who makes a games design series called Game Maker's Toolkit. If you Google versatile verbs, it is the first hit that comes up, and there's even a giant picture of Mario jumping, just to help remind you. And once you've kind of watched that one, and you really, really enjoy it, I recommend just binging on the rest of his series. I think he's got like 60 videos or so now, and they're fantastic. So the next skill, which I have to use every day, is presenting. Ooh. So public speaking is often dreaded. I know when I was at college and university, I was a nervous wreck doing this kind of thing. If you told me back then, I'd be kind of reasonably comfortable getting up in front of, um, in front of like a lecture hall or in some case like full-on theatres. I probably would have laughed in your face and told you where to go. But you'd be surprised how often you actually need to do public speaking in your role kind of outside of these events. So we have daily stand-ups. So already you're talking about your work and talking to others, potentially between three and 10 people daily. Then we have our bi-weekly team updates, where you may go up and talk about the piece of work or kind of the feature that you've been working on in front of 50 or more people. And then we have our studio-wide updates, where you could be up in front talking of like 200 people or more. So I still get kind of nervous when I do speaking, though hopefully you guys can't tell too much. But it really is one of those things that the more you do of it, the more comfortable you become with it. Like the nerves, they never really fully go away, but you do learn to work with them. And my biggest tip for public speaking is to be prepared. Like it can take, if you can take a little bit of time beforehand, if you're not trying to cram your slides together in the night before when you're doing a presentation, if you do maybe do it a week or so before, give yourself some time, some space. It gives you some time to practice, to iterate on them. Then that will help you feel more in control. It will help you feel like you know your content more and really feel like you know what you're doing. I mean, I know I put my deck together a couple of weeks back and then I've just been going over it every so often since then. Again, just to help me feel like I know what I'm talking about. I know I made a joke earlier about um, artists seeing designers as just kind of writing mountains and mountains of documentation. And that's kind of true, but not completely. So you may have heard traditionally of the game design document. It was like the Bible, which contained all of the game design for the game. And if it wasn't in the game design, it didn't happen. Well, again, things are changing. Games are becoming too large, too full of moving parts to kind of have one document that contains everything. I mean, even looking at it from a practical point of view on larger games, by the time you finish printing that thing out, it's gonna be out of date anyway. And think of all those trees you've just wasted. So some companies still have kind of a format of this, but digitally so that it can be updated far more quickly. But at Rare, we've kind of ditched this and we actually have more of a wiki based um, version instead for our project. So this means multiple people can be accessing and amending pages. It's kind of easy to see revision history. And most importantly, it's easy to search and find what you are looking for. So one of our main jobs as designers is to give other developers on the team the information they need in a clear and concise format. You could write pages and pages and pages of detailed design, but I will tell you now, no one's going to read it. If people won't even read their emails, they're not gonna read a 10,000 word essay. Also, if you want that level of control over every single detail in the game, the game will never get finished, and you're probably just going to annoy a whole lot of people in the process. Instead, it's better to give an understanding of what you're trying to do, why you're doing it, and what it should be feeling like for the player. This then gives the person who's going to go off and work on that feature a much more rounded view. So not only do they have a little bit of creative freedom and feel engaged and like they're contributing to the project, 
they may also have a better solution that you haven't thought of because they know their craft better than you do. Design should be a dialogue, not a dictation. And rolling off the back of that, sometimes writing isn't the best way to put forward an idea. So using reference photos and videos is a huge part of design. It gives people a visual way of being like, hey, imagine combining this style of movement over this type of terrain. Boom, people can see that image in their heads. And like they say, a picture is worth a thousand words and visuals can be a great way to get people engaged with the project early on. There's a whole bunch of research, I mean, this is literally one of hundreds of infographics I could have pulled from, that back up just how important visual learning is. So in that kind of line, some of the stuff I've had to do at work is I've had to cut together ripomatics or ripos as they are short in a short version. So these are kind of small videos that based around a topic are cut together with just a series of footage that you can find like on the internet so that you filmed yourself over a, mu a music track. And they're often used to kind of get across the gist or feeling of a feature. And they can be shown to other departments to help them understand what you're trying to achieve. So video editing skills are another one that you can add to your tool belt. And talking of communicating with other departments, just having a broad understanding of a range of disciplines just makes communication so much easier. A lot of my work revolves around prototyping. I go into the engine and kind of hack something together. I get it doing vaguely what it needs to be doing. I test it out with a bunch of people and see how it feels. And if that all goes well, I then start working with our programming team to help them actually implement that feature correctly. So because of that, I get to do a huge amount of different things. Recently, that's ranged from like character AI work across to UI implementation, from building animation graphs, even across to basic visual effects. So my background of art, animation, and scripting, I've been able to kind of utilize all of that and my technical skills that I've picked up since joining, and I just get to do a bit of everything. So how did I end up here? Like, how did the skills I picked up in other jobs lead me to where I am now? So I've been in the industry coming up for, I think, four years now, and I've changed roles three times in that space. My path so far certainly hasn't been a linear one. So I started out as a junior artist, I moved across to being a community manager, and now I'm a technical designer. And like the games industry is kind of renowned for these wonky paths we all take through. But even I'm like, yeah, that's a bit of an odd route. But that does mean I've had a pretty wide set of experiences, which has kind of all fed into me building this generalist skill set, which really helps me immensely in my current role. So starting at the beginning, I studied art and animation on the computer arts course up at Aberté University. I didn't know if there would be some younger people in here, but yeah, I want to stress, you don't have to go to university to get a career in games. The single most important thing you can have when you apply for a games job is your portfolio, and you can develop that on your own. However, as you're kind of going to see as I talk you through my career, being a games course student can offer you a lot of different opportunities that if you take advantage of, it can help you get your foot in the door. It gives you access to the software that we use, although that barrier has kind of been dropping slowly over time. It gives you a chance to work through in teams, space that you can actually just grow and develop in yourself, in your person and in your craft. And it can also help with visas. So if like long term plan, you want to work, I don't know, abroad at somewhere like Blizzard, something to bear in mind, it can help you get there. But saying all that, if uni isn't your thing, there are other things that you can do to get involved in the industry. Other pieces of software you can learn and transfer your skills across to, and other ways to pick up group skills. I'm, I'm a big believer that if you want to do something, if you really, really want to do it, you will find a way to do it. And you'll be the ones that get a job in our industry regardless of whether or not you go to university. So my experiences at Aberté, I did a lot of different things. I worked on my first game project with a slightly confusing title for people who aren't Scottish. I projected a hand-drawn scene onto the side of our library for Christmas carolers. I studied abroad in Copenhagen um, as an animator to work on a story world project. And I helped create a multi-award winning tablet game called Seek. So when I was at uni, um, Uchroma was kind of my first real big deep dive into game development. So I spent a semester studying out in Copenhagen working as a lead animator on a story world project. And we produced a brief animated short and then an accompanying companion game, in our case, kind of like this weed Tamagotchi style kind of world. So here I really got to start refining my art and animation experience. Um, I got to do both hand keyed animation as well as try out motion capture for the first time. And we got to do the entire process. We got to set the software up. We got to kind of dance about with the wand to kind of define the space. We got to be inside the suits themselves and acting everything out and then clean up the animation, which is really weird when you know it's you and you're like, I didn't know I used to do that. 
And then we also retargeted it, retargeted it across to our tiny little guys and then put them in engine as well. I also had my first taste of production. So I had a team of animators reporting into me. I had deadlines, deliverables, asset standards, pipeline work, and naming conventions that I not only had to concept, but I also had to adhere to. I had to balance what our design team wanted, which was everything, versus what we could actually produce in the timescale we had, which was in four months, not a great deal. And it gave me experience in scoping out work clients, which is one of the most useful skills that you can have. Today, if somebody asks me at work, how long do you think this is gonna take? I can be pretty accurate with my estimates, and that makes it easier for other people to plan their work around me and maybe even integrate their work into what I'm doing. And again, just helps, that, helps the team run far more smoothly. It also taught me to be flexible with kind of my thinking and my negotiating. It's not helpful to anyone to be like, we can't do this, we can't do that, we don't have the time, we don't have the resources. Instead, what is useful is saying, okay, we can't do that, but this is what we could do. Or we don't have, we can't make X, Y, and Z, but we do have A, B, and C we could potentially combine. Can you work with that? If you can kind of learn to focus on like the feeling that you want in the player and not be completely tied to the specific mechanic itself, that means that you can have flexibility with your team. They'll be able to find a way to achieve what you really want. And that's kind of the gold star of design. And on a side note, the negotiation skills that you pick up whilst doing these kind of things, they come in super useful for other parts of your career, whether that's sorting out like freelance contracts, negotiating pay rises, or even just being able to mediate between two other parties that are having a bit of a disagreement. So after Ecroma, I took part in what used to be called Dare to be Digital and is now Dare Academy. So back then, it was an international student competition where the ultimate prize was winning a BAFTA. So alongside my teammates, we created Seek, Find Your Friends, which where you use the tablet as a window to the world around you. So if you wanted to look up, you had to look up. If you wanted to look behind you, you had to turn around and look behind you. Now this was back in 2014, so this was just before VR kind of really took off. So it was like cutting edge, <laughs> cutting edge technology at that point. Um, and here I had kind of like my first foray into level art and design, animation on the characters, 2D art and video, ed video editing for kind of some of our marketing work that we did. But it was also my first chance to actually work in Unreal. Everything before that had been made in Unity. So I got to start diversifying my software knowledge. But probably more usefully, I actually picked up a whole bunch of non-technical skills. And one of them was I was blogging our entire development, much in the way of kind of like a daily dev diary. And again, it's those kind of extra skills that feed into my work now. So as we work through prototypes, the most important thing we can document is not our progress, but our learnings. Why have we done something in a certain way? What unexpected outcome caused us to maybe change our direction ever so slightly from our original proposal? The hows, like how we've implemented something, how all the systems link together, they can be useful for new people coming on board and they can understand how everything's kind of linked together. But it's the whys that hold the real value. So as we continue to work on Seek, we won a chance to showcase at the Unreal Engine booth at EGX um, that year, back in 2014. So off we all headed down to Earl's Court in London for a week. And I had my first chance of demoing at an industry event. So if you've ever showcased anything, I'm sure you guys will have had the same experience. At the start of the week, you have this really long winding pitch that you give to people as they kind of come up and you, you explain your game to them. And by the end of the week, you've been watching kind of what parts that you've been saying resonates with the audiences, you've been cutting and streamlining it, mainly because your voice is dying and you're really, really tired, until you've nailed it down into kind of three concise, coherent pitches. So the first one is the one-liner. It's the thing you entice people with as they kind of walk past and you're like, hey, check out yada, yada, yada. The second is kind of like the short explanation. Like you've harnessed their interest with the one-liner, they're like, cool, tell me more. And so now that you tell them, you expand a little bit more on it, you probably include a couple of sound bites in it in case you've accidentally talked to press and you haven't really realized it. And then the third is the demo explanation. They've sat down, they're ready to play, they're engaged with what they want to do. And at that point, you're kind of running them through either the controls or potentially setting them up for the experience that they're about to have. So how is that helpful as a technical designer? Well, you have to sell your work internally to other departments. You need to get their engagement and buy-in if you want them to help you make your ideas. So the one-liner suits that enticing chat as you pass each other in the corridor. It's like, oh, hey, how are you doing? You doing anything cool? It's like, yeah, I'm working on this amazing thing. They're like, that sounds dead interesting, but I have to get to a meeting. 
The second, the short explanation, you, ha you have as your, you know, slightly longer queue, maybe at lunchtime or you're waiting by the coffee machine and you kind of engage them like, hey, you said that you're doing something really cool the other day. Can you tell me a bit more? And then you tell them a bit more and you're like, if you're ever free, man, drop by my desk. And then the third, they get that full demo when they swing by to be like, yeah, I wanted to come play that thing that you were talking about. I want to see what you've been working on. It's kind of developing almost like a patter, like a sales patter pitch. It's really useful for kind of the current features you're working on so that you can just instantly be able to talk really efficiently about what you're saying and about what you're making to other people and get them excited about it. So after we kind of finished off with Seek, I am um, studying my final year at university. We won a scholarship to go out to the GDC, so the, the Game Developers Conference out in San Francisco. Um, so this is myself alongside all the other lovely scholars from that year. And there was a lot of cool things that kind of happened at GDC, but one of the big standout moments was that Unreal Engine had put a giant picture of our game on the side of their booth without telling any of us. So I discovered this on the GDC floor. The picture really doesn't do it justice because it's actually like probably a one and a half times the height of this wall. It was massive. I squealed very loudly because I was not expecting it. I'm like, but that's our game. Other people started clapping around and like, congratulations. It was this really weird and lovely moment that only happens at um, gaming conferences. Um, so obviously this is me like, I can't believe this is happening. So I run up, go and thank everyone on the team and end up sitting on top of their booth, being invited up, sitting on top of their booth, eating cookies and brownies with half the studio, just kind of chatting with lots of different people and getting lots of people, different people's life stories. And what it ended up being is we were coming up to being releasing our game and they organized for us to do a pitch to Apple with two hours notice. We didn't have a pitch prepared. We didn't have any Apple devices on any of us. So we ended up pitching to Apple on an Android phone, which he took very, very well, I will say. And thankfully, it did all go very successfully because we ended up actually being featured on the App Store on release. But again, this all relates back to technical design now because you're going to be communicating with different disciplines all of the time. So being comfortable talking to people that maybe you haven't had a lot of interaction with before or kind of come from a different background is a total bonus. And always being prepared or ready to talk about what you're doing in kind of any scenario or on very, very little notice is great. So many times I've kind of been in this scenario where somebody else has been bringing um, other people from Microsoft, maybe our Redmond office or other Microsoft studios for a tour. They come around and they're like, hey, remember that thing we talked about at the coffee machine and then I dropped by your desk. Can you show that thing to this person? It's, it's really cool. You totally want to see what they're doing. And then the visitor looks at you with that sweet, eager face like, oh, please tell me more. And you're like, right, I am not prepared for this at all, but let's do this. So paradoxically, just always expect to have to do the unexpected. So we finished off Seek, our final year of university, and at this point, with kind of some hindsight now, I can totally see why I ended up in a generalist position. So what's playing for you is a montage from my honors project. So Rose, it's the story about a girl who loses her brother in a tragedy, and then her brother's spirit comes back to let her know that she'll be okay. So I made a full game, it's completely playable on a tablet or mobile device, and apart from the rigging, and the music and sound effects, which you can't hear anyway, I did everything else. So modeling, texturing, animations, VFX, lighting, design, scripting. And I really, really enjoyed it. Like I really enjoy learning lots and lots of different things and kind of being able to shift backwards and forwards between them. And I think I, think I pulled this together in about eight weeks in the end because I hadn't been very well that year. Um, and again, made it unreal. And I was pretty happy with it. And I think as a technical designer, just having an innate pull to learn more, to keep learning, to wanting to try new things, is kind of a necessity. So we're always doing something new, which probably requires us to use or create tools that we haven't done before. And that can be quite scary for a lot of people. You're constantly stepping outside your comfort zone, constantly pushing yourself both technically and mentally. And you've got to have faith in yourself that even if there isn't really a clear path that you can see when you start out, you'll find one as you progress. So, woo, I graduate and I get my first job in the industry as a junior artist at 4J Studios. So whilst I was across there, I was mainly responsible for like the textures for the environments, for the characters and for some of the mobs, as well as doing some of the item design work. Um, I got to do some animated texture work as well for like the lava, the water, the nether portal. And I even picked up some JavaScript for Photoshop plugins and wrote some basic tools for our art exports and the pipeline. 
Now, probably the highlight, which is why there's a giant picture of it, was working with Nintendo to help create the Super Mario mashup pack. So I helped refactor the items to bring them in line with the Mario universe. And as a huge Nintendo fan, it was a bit of a dream come true. But before this role, I hadn't specifically done any pixel art. I think the first time I did pixel art was about three days before my interview there. Um, there wasn't a lot of time between that and graduating. So I was taking kind of all of my previous art skills and applying them in a new way, kind of learning on the job, which is kind of what I do now in my day to day. So you can start to see as I'm talking through this, there's a bit of a recurring theme here around flexibility, transferable skill sets, learning something new. And you can start to see kind of how these early experiences, they how everything that you do can start to feed into where you end up. So after 4J, I actually had a pretty big shift and I moved across to Epic Games. So my role was more along the lines of developer relations and support. So I was the Unima European Community Manager for Unreal Engine, which just fits on a business card when you get them printed. Um, so I worked on the game engine side. So I worked with all of the developers across Europe who was using Unreal Engine to make their games. So I sh had shifted from kind of this hands-on, like making games all the time kind of role to more of a support to help other people be able to do that. And I spent the next two years in just this whirlwind of chaos and craziness, doing everything from kind of biz dev, tech support, marketing and PR, including cutting together sizzle reels, finance, representing and talking at events like these, or helping running booths like some people upstairs have been doing and showcasing their games, and so much more. And it really opened my eyes to how wide our industry is. So I was no longer in this art bubble. I wasn't even in this kind of hands-on just development bubble. I was talking to everyone from founders and VPs to publishing and funding to even government bodies and industry bodies. I'd helped out with some of the enterprise events at Epic. So enterprise was our non-game sections. And we were chatting to people from automobile, aviation, power, oil, transport, all people that still use our software. And I think the surrealist moment I had was I ended up speaking with somebody from the United Nations and it was a very strange experience. But hands down, kind of that talking, that networking, that getting out and meeting people, the communication and presentation training that I had while I was there was pretty, pardon the pun, epic. So I, I went from spending 15 minutes writing a single email, obsessively being like scrutinizing my phrasing, is my tone, is this coming across, is it too jokey, is it not jokey enough, to just being able to kind of like knock out these emails in a couple of minutes. And part of that was building a kind of a bank of phrases and ways that you can say things that you can just pull on. And that also transfers across into like talking to people naturally. So I used to call them icebreakers, but having those lines or phrases where you can just easily strike up a conversation with someone. So it could be related to the event that you were at. It could have been like pop culture related. Like, guys, what did you think of the finale of Game of Thrones? That kind of thing. Easy points that you can pull on to get people talking. And it's, again, it's all these small skills of just being able to kind of easily pick up and chat or be able to communicate with others that definitely makes my job a lot easier today. But alongside all of my support work, I never stopped making things. I was still working away on my own little project. So this was a piece inspired by a poem called My Hearts in the Highlands by Robert Burns. And I always kept a hand in making things because I never wanted to lose touch with that. And although I really, really enjoyed the work I did at Epic, like I knew my heart always belonged in making games. So that kind of brings me full circle back to Rare. So in a wrap up of all of that, it's really important to have the technical skills to be able to put this stuff together in an engine, but really don't forget about those soft skills that you find along the way. Games are all about teamwork. The more effectively you can communicate with others and have an awful lot of fun whilst doing so, it just kind of makes development all the more enjoyable for everyone. And in many ways, soft skills are the more important ones and they're also the harder ones to develop. So just make sure you grab every opportunity to practice them that you can, because they're often the ones that will set you apart from other candidates if you're looking for roles. So I've kind of talked you through what a technical designer is, advice for how to grow your technical design tool belt. And I've looked into kind of my path into becoming a technical designer and the skills I picked along the way. Now I want to talk to you about what the effects of being a technical designer has on your life. Because although it's pretty hunky-dory 90% of the time, there are a few points I figured I should tell you about. So, you know, you get a nice rounded view and you walk into this with your eyes open. And for this, I roped in some of the dogs of Rare, because yes, you are allowed to bring your dog to work at Rare. Just in case anything may be a little bit too much and break your heart, you can look into its adorable eyes and all will be well again. So I'm gonna start with the big one. You can't ever talk about what you're doing whilst you're doing it. 
Because you spend most of your time working in the pre-production phase, you're always working on what's next, on what's yet to be announced. So you spend most of your time up to your eyeballs in the NDAs. So I will caveat now, if there's any questions later on, I will definitely do my best to answer them, but please respect if I say I can't talk about that. It may not be apparent, but I really, really, really like my job, so just help me keep it, especially as I'm being filmed. <laughs> Another big point is making games does not equal playing games. So I know that there are a few exceptions to this, but the majority of people I chat to once they get into the industry experience this massive drop off in the amount of games they play. I know I've noticed it definitely. I play a lot less as time has progressed. Part of that is down to time commitments. I go from being in university to working a full-time job. But for me personally, part of it is I spend my day looking at a screen. I kind of want to spend my free time not doing that. And it also ties in earlier to what I was talking about living. Like I try and pack in as many other activities and different things that I can do throughout my week as well. So whether that's what ice skating lessons on a Monday, bouldering on a Tuesday, D&D on a Wednesday. So my downtime is also pretty limited from just wanting to go out and experience different things. And even worse, when I finally do get time to play games, it actually becomes a lot harder to be pulled into the game itself because instead you kind of sit there and analyze it. So earlier I talked about finding systems and everything. Well, in games, where you know there are systems in place, you're going to be sitting there and trying to reverse engineer what's going on instead. So I do it all the time. So my area of interest outside of design is shaders and vertex animation. And I will quite often stop mid-game to just look at something that's caught my interest. And I specifically remember it when I was playing Abzu. Um, absolutely gorgeous game. Love the art style, love the music. So if you haven't played it, would totally recommend it. But instead of enjoying this like visual feast for the eyes and the ears, I'm sitting there trying to work out how they're doing the lighting and shaders. Very specifically, I'm trying to work out how they're doing the lighting and shaders on a rock. There's a beautiful ice cavern they have at one point, and as you dive through, it looks really great. And all my brain is going, yep. And it's also sitting there going, there's definitely a Fresnel in that shader somewhere. I know there is. Now, my developer brain was also compounded by the fact that Abzu is made in Unreal Engine 4. So I knew I had access to the same tools as the developer, and therefore I could attempt to reproduce the effects if I could just work out how they did it. As well as analyzing games, you will also find that your taste in games will change because you begin appreciating different aspects of them. So a game you once maybe called simplistic is now a model example of subtractive game design. A game that was no interest is kind of a prime example of technical prowess and optimization. You'll find yourself seeking out new titles that maybe challenge your way of playing or thinking, or being pulled into the latest viral game and trying to work out why it's so captivating to everyone. One of the great things about doing prototyping work is you're always doing something different. One of the worst things about prototyping is it's very rare that any of your actual hands-on work will end up in the final release. Everything you make is designed to be throwaway, but it's still kind of sad to not be able to point at anything tangible in a game and be like, why well, did that? Why well, made that tree? And it will also happen that you will spend a whole bunch of time prototyping out a feature, potentially even getting it to the point where it's almost fully integrated, which will then be cut down the line for just any number of different reasons. And it's frustrating, but it's something that will happen. So we used to have a joke at our university that our lecturers used to make, which was, you weren't a real developer until you worked on a project that had gotten canned. And before you ask, because somebody did actually ask me this the other week, I'm technically not a real developer yet by that standard, but I've got plenty of time ahead for that to happen. So hopefully, after those, I haven't scared you off and you guys are still kind of interested in working in the games industry. So what I wanted to finish on today was just a couple of different things that you guys can get involved in that are coming up over the next few months. Um, now I'm going to start with an absolute shameless plug. Um, we are hiring for a whole bunch of different roles, including design right now. If, so in case anything you've heard has made you kind of interested more about life at Rare, please head across to rare.co.uk slash careers to kind of check out what we have on, on offer. And that's the shameless plug over. So I don't think there's anyone under 18 in this audience here. I was prepared. Oh, yes, there is. Perfect. Well, this slide is specifically for you. Um, so every year, BAFTA holds a young games designer competition to encourage and showcase the next generation of talent. So the competition is open to all UK residents who are aged 10 to 18 years old during the school year. And it's also split into two age categories. So you have like a younger entry and then a, an older entry. 
So there's two types of um, awards and two types of different uh, paths that you can go in through. So you can go in through the game's concept, which you basically kind of write the design for a game and just do it all through documentation. And the second type is games making. So using the software of your choice, you can make and submit a game and you can also do it in a team with other people. So your entries are judged by a panel of industry people. So it's a really, really great first exposure to the industry. I've actually been part of the jury for this in the past. And I am amazed by what gets made. Like seriously, some of the entries in here have been better than university work I've seen from other students. So everyone who enters it, they have the best ideas and just really run with it, their imagination. It's so amazing. And the prize for both streams is to actually work with developers who will help further develop your game at the end of it as well. So I think, I think the entries open up at the end of the year, but if you keep an eye on like the BAFTA websites or their kind of news channels like Twitter and things, they'll definitely kind of put out an announcement when it's open for entry. Another way that you can also get involved in kind of jam in making games is to take part in game jams. So a game jam is where you build a game in a set period of time based around a theme. So these can range from kind of a couple of hours in some cases to a full week. So I took part in the Global Game Jam, which is the world's largest jam normally held, I think, in the kind of end of January, a couple of years ago, and the theme was Waves. So myself and friend Gary Napper made Crime Wave City, which is a game where you race around the streets in your police car trying to capture jewellery robbers by ejecting yourself out of your police car and then have kind of a powwow cam bam with them to uh, catch them and uh, hinder their progress. And the cool thing about game jam entries is they tend to just be this wonderful place where you can try out a wacky idea, maybe learn a completely new bit of software, and just have a lot of fun with the people around you. So there are a couple of jams coming up um, within the next few months. So remember earlier how I was talking about versatile verbs in an awesome series by Mark Brown called Game Maker's Toolkit? Well, Mark holds a yearly jam. I think this is his third year for doing it, and it's going to be running from August 2nd to August 4th this year. It's a 48 hour jam, and I think you can already pre-register for it up on itch.io, so you'll have more details when it's ready. And another one, which is a little bit further away, so it gives you a bit more time to prep in case you want to, is the Ludlandari jam. So this is from October 4th to October 7th. This will be their 45th jam. They run one every six months. It's one of the largest jams in the world, and it's one of the longest running jams in the world as well. And what's really nice about these ones, because they are online, you can take part from anywhere. There's also a really great community around them as well. They're a great place to start making games, meeting other developers and chatting with them, and just getting feedback on your work and ideas. So in conclusion, kind of after all of that, if you love learning, always trying something new, if you enjoy making things and working with lots of different people, and if you want to be at the forefront, kind of leading the way to unknown shores, then technical design and everything that it encompasses is definitely the role that you're looking for. And on that, that brings me to the end with Apollo. So thank you guys for listening. So we do have time if anyone has questions. If anyone is not comfortable asking questions in the room, you can at Jess Hyde or me on either Twitter or LinkedIn, and I, my DMs are open, or I will be hanging around for a little bit afterwards if you want to do ones-to-ones. -ones. So anyone brave enough to ask a question, or anyone have any thoughts? Yes? I've got a, possibly a dumb question, because I don't work in the gaming industry. Sure. But is uh, technical designer, is that a kind of industry term, or is that a rare term? It is, it is now an industry term. Okay. Um, I, so when I found out that I got the role, I hadn't really heard of it before. And then I was playing through, I think it was Horizon Zero Dawn, and I was watching the credits, and they had one person named as a technical designer, and I went, oh, I'm not alone, there's others of us. Um, and I do. I have met since then a few others. Um, and I think there was a talk this year at GDC about technical design be, and defining it as a specific role. So I think there's been a lot of designers in the past who have had technical experience and are more than happy to go in and kind of start making things. But actually having it now as a structured role where it's part of almost like the job spec of it is we're expecting you to come in to be able to concept the ideas, but we also expect you then to be able to implement them or even potentially further down the line, we expect you after the engineers have built tools for you to do it, to be able to then create that content that way instead. Yeah. So yeah, it's just now kind of being formalized as a role. Yeah, I think it helps 
robots giving it a name. It's, it's so cross-disciplinary. I work in robotics. Oh, nice. So you have mechanical engineers and you have electronic engineers and software engineers, but you get very siloed in those roles. Yeah. Um, and not know much about the, about the other. Um, we don't. We don't have a. We, we have mechatronic engineers, but that's has uh, never. You know. Never yep. really caught up with something that a lot of people do. So I think originally this used to be split into your designers, which were kind of the ones, again, just how games and design is just working in general, especially in AAA is changing, but it used to be kind of designers sat in a tower and kind of dictated things down and literally like pieces of paper almost were passed to people. It's like, this is what you need to make. Um, and potentially underneath them, I think they used to be called scripters, where they weren't necessarily full engineering level, but they were the ones that would go in and start kind of, again, doing what I'm kind of doing in some ways and just hacking together what the designers wanted because the designers couldn't do it. And now we're hitting that point where we've got like an amalgamation of the two so and then it also then stops it from being that kind of like down the chain kind of thing it's much more of a collaborative process as well which is nice yeah uh, yeah i've got a bunch of questions uh first one is uh how long does it take you to like uh, make a mock-up or like how long do you like set budget for like a mock-up um, so one that I've just done, I did in three days to get the first stage of it done. So the way that we kind of propose them down is we tend to split stuff into multiple um, kind of briefs. So it's like we have maybe the overarching feature and then we kind of define like different levels of it. So you almost have like your MVP and then kind of your iterational builds on top of it. Um, and by doing that, we want it to be very quick. We don't want me to be working on something for two weeks to get to the end of the two weeks to be like, yeah, that's totally the wrong direction. So you want to kind of split it down into the smallest chunks possible, mm -hmm. play and test though, well, get them up and running and then play and test them straight away and then see, is there something here? Because if there is, great, you can continue working through it. If there's not, you've actually, you're wasting far less time by doing it that way. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is like, uh, what's, like, is there a good way to like figure out like to get better at like the uh, writing up process of the idea? Part of it is a lot of it comes down to kind of practice and iteration. One of the things um, and structure of how you lay it out. So if you specifically start when you're coming up with an idea or a proposal, if you ask yourself a series, if you have your goals as almost like a series of questions of like. Um, how do we get our players to do X or things like that? Then what you can do is as you're finding your learnings, you can actually almost slot them directly in underneath it. It's like, how do, I, how do we get our players to do X? Well, we can get it, them to do it this way or this way or this way, but not this way because this didn't work for this reason. So kind of structuring it in that format where you're almost asking yourself a question, um, I find that that makes me a lot better with my kind of write-ups okay. at the end. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? Yes? Yeah, it's been really interesting learning about these jobs I didn't know existed. But can you predict a job that will exist in five or ten years' time that doesn't exist now? Nope. <laughs> so one there we go. Um, no, because it's one of those things where I think jobs come out of necessity, potentially out of like new software. A lot of the reason that technical designers I think exist now is because the software that we use is so much more accessible and approachable. So I don't have a full programming background. I have an arts degree, funnily enough. Um, but I have enough knowledge, I could do the basic kind of scripting, so like your JavaScript and action script is the first thing I learned, Visual Basic. Um, and going from them to then across into Blueprint, which is visual scripting, which takes a while to get your head around if you're going from code scripting to visual scripting. But once you're there, it, it makes debugging and things, and the tools themselves have become a lot more accessible. So part of it, I think, is sometimes driven by either um, kind of genres in the industry kind of bubbling up that are new, which are very hard to predict. Um, and part of it, I think, is also by how our tools um, improve over time, which again, it's very hard to predict. Mm -hmm. So who knows, there will be more. We can always say that there will be something new. So just being, I think, having some degree of kind of tech knowledge or just kind of base knowledge across the board, it seems to get hit most things. Yes? Uh, yeah, is it like, uh, how do you uh, deal with like, a, do, you, do you ever have to deal with like systems that are like too big? Or like, a, like systems that will, like something, like an idea that's too big? So yes, and then at that point we start, if it's something massive, we look at ways that we can cut it down and we can make it into those smaller chunks. Because again, what are, if you have something that is massive that one person is working on, you're probably a bottleneck for a whole bunch of other people who are reliant on that work. So you need to look at how can you slice that work in different ways to be able to kind of either slice the feature itself or even just slice and distribute the work better. Okay, uh, 
is this something that's like a bit engine related? Uh, like you said, you work with like Unreal and Unity. Mm -hmm. uh, does Unreal have like a better like nav, nav mesh systems than Unity? I think better is always dependent on what you want to do. I think it's, it comes down to the question of, well, what game engine should I use? Well, you know, what game engine is the best? And it's like, no one game engine is the best at everything. It's all completely relevant and reliant on what your project is. Um, I know Unreal's nav mesh is pretty good for like um, bipedal characters. Mm -hmm. Could Unity's be better at quadrupeds? It could be, I've not had to do that inside un Unity. So I'd say, work out what you need it to do and then go look at it from that angle. Any other, yes? Um, you said that um, people going into the game industry they don't need to do Yeah. Um, what would be your advice to someone who's looking to go into it but doesn't have to be or has it in a, a different area that's not competing? So degrees in different areas are totally are still relevant. So one of my um, good friends, Adrienne Law, she's the producer across the Us Two games. So she worked on Monument Valley and Monument Valley Two. Um, her degree is in English literature, I think. So it's really weird. In some ways, I think sometimes you will see applications that say, you know, I must have a degree of yada yada. Um, a lot of this stuff, kind of caveat here, a lot of the stuff you see on kind of uh, games jobs kind of requirements they're very squishy requirements. Like they get cut and added as they needed to. So if you don't hit everything, still apply for it anyway. Because again, like I said, it's portfolio based and experience that are normally the two biggest ones. And people will just kind of forget about the other bits and other requirements if you can kind of fulfill the other parts. Um, so one of the guys that I work with, um, he's a narrative designer and his degree is in, I wanna say biochemistry or something like that. And he's been able to draw on a lot of his knowledge almost as kind of like a subject e expert. So we can go and ask him questions or, you know, that are relevant to his degree. And it's actually really nice to have all that kind of mix of knowledge in house because you can be like, hey, I wanna know more about this. And somebody's like, hey, did you know that they studied that when they were at uni? And you're like, no, I will go talk to them, great. So don't ever think that it's gonna hold you back in any way. Okay. Great, cool. I guess Dan is giving me the thumbs up. We're done. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>